I've got some questions that I'd like to ask them. Absolutely. Um, so I'm going to read my own writing. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, um, the first bit's about uh, 9 to 5, the musical. Last question was, are you a fan of Dolly Parton's music? I think it would be a little tricky to be in 9 to 5, the musical, if you weren't a fan of Dolly Parton's music. I mean, I think um, it's almost... It's almost um, you could almost be as equally a fan of Dolly Parton and all of the the things that she's done as you could be a fan of the music that she's written. I think uh, you know, obviously, her music is so famous; everybody knows all of her songs, and uh, and she's a legend in her own right. But then the uh, sort of the work that she's doing for the LGBTQ community and for children and all sorts of different groups that are that are struggling or haven't, um, you know, uh, well. She's, she's been so so fantastic with all these different groups. So um, I think you could be a fan in, in, of Dolly Parton in many different ways and not just her music. But yes, I am a fan of her music, absolutely. Um, I don't suppose you've met her when you were... Did you not no, come I to didn't. press night or anything? No, I, I didn't get to meet her, I'm afraid. But um, some of our cast... If You, you saw uh, the musical, did you? You saw the show. Um, I missed her when it was turning around okay no worries well some of our cast were the original cast in london and also some of them toured with the show beforehand um so there were a handful of us that were new but i believe that the original london cast did get to meet dolly um they uh there was a red carpet event and and the press night as you as you say but sadly for us you know in the throes of COVID and with the disruption that that caused, unfortunately, we uh, we didn't get to meet her, which is a shame. But um, but it's probably for the best. It's probably safer that she uh, that she kept her distance. You know. What's it like? Um, because some musicals are about like Michael Jackson sadly died. So what's it like uh -huh. playing um, music with someone who's still living? That's an interesting question. Um, I hadn't really thought about it because obviously, obviously you're absolutely right. Dolly Parton is still alive. In a way, it's in a way it's uh, you know it's nice whenever you're singing music that's written by someone who's passed because you kind of feel as though you're honouring their work. And I guess that doesn't really change whenever the person's still alive because you know at the same time it's their writing. If Dolly Parton was to pop in and see the show unannounced. You'd like to think that she enjoyed what you were doing with it, but um, aside from that, I guess um, I guess it's uh, it's just nice to think that the person who wrote the music uh, is is still around enjoying it. It's the same with the likes of Andrew Lloyd Webber or Tim Rice or any of these people who you know are have, have written so many musicals and and they're still around and they still come to see the shows. Um, that that of of their productions, and uh, I'm sure they get rid of it eventually. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they've seen a lot of their own music and a lot of their own shows. But um, you know, absolutely, it's nice. It's nice to know that they're still around and and in a different world. Perhaps Dolly would have come over to have seen the show, and it would have been you know a real honour to have, to have performed for her her own music. You know, but uh, as I say, it wasn't to be. You auditioned and everything. Did you see? nine to five beforehand just no, to I get hadn't. a feel of what the show was about no i i, I didn't sadly uh, which is terrible because it was in london for about a year and then it was on tour as well and i didn't get to see it um or rather it's not that i didn't get to see it i didn't make enough effort to see it there's a very distinct difference and uh there, there is obviously a movie as well that can be watched that uh which is what the whole musical was based on so I, I've seen clips of it. I've seen sort of extracts from it, but I haven't seen the entire movie either, which is terrible. But I also think sometimes when you're, when you're working as an actor, it's easy to watch what other people have done and to try and emulate it. Or it's easier, perhaps, especially because there are a lot of questions that need to be answered whenever you're dealing with a piece of new text or something that's new to you. So sometimes it feels easier to go and look at what other people have done in other shows and uh and then it gives you a guideline but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be doing the best version of 
the work. And it, you know, sometimes it's more exciting as well to, uh, to kind of discover all of these things for yourself. You know, this, our production of nine to five wasn't the first ever time that nine to five had happened. So, um, although I didn't get to see it and I didn't really know what to expect in many ways, it was more interesting to discover all of that organically once we got to rehearsals and, uh, and it meant that as well, when I went to my auditions, I didn't know what to try and be like. So it meant that if I was closer to being right for the job, just by being myself and doing what I thought was right, then hopefully that would stand me in good stead if I got the role, which I was very lucky to do so. So, and hopefully it did, it did stand me in good stead. So what were you, um, was this your touring around for a few months? It was indeed, yeah. We um, we started in Southampton after we had two weeks of rehearsals and a week of tech, which is getting everything into the theatres um, and getting it ready to go on the road. And we uh, and we started in Southampton and we had a couple of little breaks. We had a break, uh, we had a, a week off in our first kind of major leg. We had a, a bigger break of about a month off at Christmas, which is kind of unheard of in theatre, so that was really nice. Um, and then we had another break just at Valentine's Day for for a week. I don't think they meant it to coincide, but that would have been a nice thought. And uh, and then we finished roughly six months later. So I believe it ran sort of July, August through till the very beginning of March. So not that long ago, about seventeen days ago, officially it ended. So, um, so yes, it was about six months or thereabouts all in. It's a lovely length of time. You said you had to say now. You said you had two weeks rehearsal. So that's quite. Yes. And normally, yeah. normally shows get a few months rehearsals. <laughs> yes, seems of a bit course. Quick two weeks. It was a very quick two weeks, and it was uh, that is entirely down to the extraordinary. Um, there's a girl. Uh, called Sierra, who is this? Oh, you know, if they ever listen to this, they'll be John will be incredibly upset that I didn't say his name first. But uh, there we go. I'm not working with them anymore. So, um, John, uh, John Reynolds, and uh, Sierra Brereton, I believe her surname is, um, are were the associate choreographer slash dance captains for our production. And in lieu of all of the American team who would normally come over and help put the show together, they weren't able to because of COVID. As a, as a result, John and Sierra ran the entire two weeks of rehearsals alongside the associate uh, director and the associate uh, musical director and, um, and all the rest. So for those two, I felt really got the show on its feet. And, uh, and we're so good at keeping us, keeping us sort of in, you know, uh, in uh, sort of time, I want to say. I, that's not what I want to say, but you know what I mean. They, they, they were so good at keeping us, keeping us right and making sure that we at the top of our game. And it meant that that two weeks was all we needed. Um, although you can always have more time, but two weeks was enough time to get it to get it ready to go. And then we, we opened a week after that. So it was, it was pretty important. Pretty impressive work, I think, by everyone. It sounds very long hours, them two weeks, <laughs> fourteen <laughs> hour days. It was it was a long it was a long old two weeks, absolutely. When you when you finish your day, you think that's it, but then you have to go home and remember everything that was that was taught to you that day. And yes, it was a lot, but it was uh, you know it's good to have a challenge like that occasionally. Obviously, you've been touring. Do you like living out of a suitcase? <laughs> Um, in some respects, yes. In many respects, no. I think uh, I think it's quite nice to have the simplicity. I think sometimes um, we. Uh, I mean, I'm 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 sat in a bedroom at the moment that's full of my stuff and my girlfriend's stuff, and there's a lot of stuff. And it's funny how life does that to you. Suddenly, end up with lots of things that you've gathered all over the place. Um, we, uh, I, I quite enjoy living out of a suitcase because it makes life pretty straightforward. You only have so many pairs of underwear. You, you know, you can't just keep wearing all your clothes without having to be organised and think about when it's getting cleaned and, and all the rest. The only problem I would say is that if you want to have home comforts with you, 
So I, for example, on 9 to 5, wanted to take my Xbox with me because it gave me something to do in my free time. I know it's terrible, but I wanted to. And I, I wanted to be able to have that communication with my friends back home and, and my brother, who also plays a bit of Xbox, whilst I was away. Because obviously, Tour is quite an isolating place um, in many respects, too. But yes, if you want to have your home comfort, it's a little tricky. But if you if you don't mind getting rid of the clutter, then it's great. It forces you to not buy things as well, because you don't have any space to put them in the suitcase. So you can't have anything new, which is good. Oh, you just answered me the next question. How do you relax after eight shows a week? Oh, dear. Well, yes, absolutely. I, I would take my Xbox with me. Well, that would be, that. that's the ideal. I didn't have it for the second leg of tour, admittedly. And I did find it difficult because, as, you, as you've asked, you know, in terms of relaxing, having an Xbox or having having some way of having downtime at the end of the day is really important. Just because you spend an awful lot of time with the same group of people, and they're lovely people, absolutely, but they're still the same group of people, and they wouldn't necessarily be your chosen people, like your partners or your family. You know, it's very rare to be working in a show where your other half, whether that's girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, is on the same production it's a very small industry and uh and all the rest but still it's it's very unlikely so you don't tend to see those people who you would choose to see as much as you'd like so having something else to distract you or having something to take your mind off everything is is really positive obviously as well we would go to the pub <laughs> plenty <laughs> but uh officially i didn't say that <laughs> Do you like exploring the places where you are, such as, well, I think you said Southampton you were at. Do you get yes, time absolutely. to look at where you are and the scenery and things? Of course. So, um, so yes is absolutely the answer. I absolutely love exploring. And um, with, uh, with 9 to 5, we got to see some pretty interesting places and a few places that I wasn't overly excited for, but then ended up really loving just because you got to do a bit of exploring and you got to see how how that kind of city operated. For example, we went to South End, which is up near Newcastle, and I'd never been to South End before. In fact, I hadn't been to a lot of the cities that we went to before, or at least not in my memory. And uh, South End was one that everyone was sort of, oh, it's South End, it's not going to be any good, no one's going to enjoy themselves. And then we got there, and it was actually really good fun. The um, It was absolutely beautiful down the coastline, we went into Newcastle for an evening for someone's birthday, and that was really good, a really good laugh. And uh, the theatre in South End was gorgeous as well. There was a coffee shop opposite the theatre that did the most incredible chocolate brownies. And, you know, so we, we did really well in South End. We, we really enjoyed ourselves. And it was, as I say, one of these places that we weren't expecting to enjoy very much. And then when we got there, it was lovely. So that's, that's kind of more so the case. It, not necessarily getting to explore places that I already knew or had already been to, but rather places that I'd never been to before and didn't know what to expect. So so that was lovely. Certainly lots of places I would like to go back to. Before the show starts, do you have any anything for your nerves? Anything you not get nerves? nerves? <laughs> yes. Um, oh, what would we do for my nerves? Sometimes... Sometimes when you when I feel nervous, I have to remind myself side of stage that, that there's a good reason why I'm here doing what I'm doing. And sometimes this will sound really silly, but sometimes I have to stand side of stage, getting ready to go on, knowing what's about to happen is going to happen. I have to remind myself that there's no other option. It's going to happen the way it is. And uh, I have to tell myself that I'm going to nail it. I'm going to do really well and it's going to be great. Even if it isn't, even if it doesn't, but, you know, it's just getting past the little voices in your head that go, turn around and run away, <laughs> or, you know, it's not going to go very well or whatever. So um, so in that respect, sometimes I just have to have a talking to with myself. But um, to be honest, there are other things that we do in the dressing rooms. So generally, uh, we would be in with, most of the boys would be in together, and uh, we'd a few of us would play cards and have a bit of a laugh. Um, 
so we would play monopoly deal or something which is really good fun and it and you get so it's a bit like xbox right it forces you to focus on what you're doing at the time you can't really think about anything else and it means that the subconscious like the, the worries that would sort of flit in or flit out don't get in the way and don't start to worry you before the show because you're too busy doing something else and then all of a sudden after you've played cards for a little bit you're getting ready for the show and then you're going straight down to the side of stage to to be ready for beginners and then the show begins and you haven't given yourself time to worry about any of the things that might that might be getting to you so in that respect yes sometimes we we distract each other by playing games and playing cards it's really good fun Um, how did you audition with COVID? Did you have to do a, a Zoom audition? <laughs> no, I didn't. But I have done a Zoom audition before now, although I didn't get very far with it. But I don't think that was down to, to Zoom. I think that was down to me. Um, yes, we the audition was a little different in that there weren't very many people there. So there was a very select few on the panel. And then there were a select few in the dance audition. I believe it was no more than 12 or thereabouts, maybe 15. So the numbers were much lower than they would have been otherwise. And um, it was a very quick process in that the first audition was on a Monday and the last audition, I think, was on a Thursday or Friday of the same week. And then by the following Monday, I'd been offered the job, which is the, the quickest turnaround that I've ever experienced. Now, that was partly because rehearsals were to start the following Monday after that. So there wasn't very long for them to make their decision, which could be a good thing or a bad thing. And for me, it was a good thing. But um, it meant that it was pretty quick and concise. And it seems to be that with other auditions as well, not just nine to five, that's a very common thing that was happening in COVID. They needed to, to find a handful of people, not necessarily a full cast, but a handful of people to join an older cast. And they would be making their decision very quickly, which was excellent. But it meant that well, it meant that either you were cut fairly quickly and you move on with your life, or you were getting through to the final rounds very quickly, and there was a very good chance that you you could book it. Um, so in that respect, it was great. But I think things will start to move away from that now because COVID is slowly sorting itself out. Well, at least that's what we're being told. <laughs> I don't think I've asked what was your role in 9 to 5, who were you playing? No, it's okay. My role was Joe, who is the love interest of Violet Newstead, who was played by Louise Redknapp. In our first, the first leg of the tour was Louise Redknapp. And the second leg um, was Claire Sweeney. So we changed actress halfway through. Um, and uh, I think Louise is now doing Fiddle Attraction, which is on tour. And Claire is doing I think kinky cabaret or something like that in London so she's or no pride cabaret not kinky cabaret yeah. oops sorry Claire <laughs> well, there you go so how did um how did the agent find find you in contact you so my so the agent or the so my personal agent I've been signed with for some time I signed with them since college so perhaps the it's interesting how uh when it comes to shows in fact they they will go out into the world and and find them find these opportunities and come back and either have submitted your name in for this for this role or for this job or sometimes in fact a casting director with the show will have found your name on a, a database called spotlight and that means that you, you know, they, they might have been looking for someone that was just like you. And then they're prepared to offer you an audition to come in and they'll get in touch with your agent. And then your agent will get in touch with you. So it's a big spider's web out there of people and and uh, who are putting all of these things in place and, and hoping that you land the job. So um, so I imagine it was through Spotlight. That's uh, so the spotlight was the the database, as I say, that keeps all of our names and all of our pictures and our jobs that we've ever done. It's all kept on spotlight. I imagine that was how it happened. So if an if an agent said you're ideal, but looking for someone with blonde hair, 
Would yes. you dye blonde hair just for the role? <laughs> I would look ridiculous, but yes, I would. <laughs> Absolutely. There are some there are some shows that that do require things like that, and if they really want you and and it's really important to have you, then they might make a choice like asking you to dye your hair or giving you a wig or something. The problem is with blonde hair. If I if I bleach my hair blonde. I've also got to bleach my eyebrows because they're so dark. I would look, I would look like my forehead was being underlined. But uh, yes, I would absolutely do those things if they asked to. Yes. Obviously, you're doing months and months of shows. How do you keep the show fresh and keep mm. it the same day it went out? Absolutely. So, rather interestingly, um, Adam Phil Pot, who's our uh, I guess our director, um, who helped put the show together, um, would regularly come in and he would watch the show with John, the associate choreographer. <laughs> and uh, between the pair of them, they would take notes on the things that were good and take notes on the things that were not so good. And often then the next day, we would have a session before the show began where they would talk us through all of those things, make amendments and uh, and bring the show back up to scratch or back up to the level that they want to see the show at. And uh, that is, that's fundamentally the way that it's kept in top quality. But it's also, I would argue, um, the responsibility of each actor on the stage to have been set a standard and then do their very best to kind of match it or meet it consistently. And uh, that's sadly, it's kind of the boring nuts and bolts of the job, but that's what it's about. They go, here's what I'd like you to do. And then you go, okay, and you do it. And they go, brilliant, keep it like that. That's wonderful. And that's your job. So that the people in Southampton get the same show as the people in Stoke, or at least a, a equally exciting show as the people in Stoke. Um, so that it doesn't lose its kind of oomph and uh, its sparkle. You know, otherwise, why should people pay the same in Stoke for a show that isn't as exciting as the show in Southampton, you know? What do you think of um, West End prices? West End Obviously, prices? they're a bit deeper than when, when you went up to Newcastle. <laughs> it would have been a yes, third of, of the price. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I uh, I think West End prices are ludicrous. I went to see um, went to see Cabaret, which is on in the West End at the moment, or is it technically West End? I guess it is. I went to see Cabaret at the Kit Kat Club, and uh, it's notoriously expensive. Unfortunately, I think I paid something like ninety pounds for the theatre ticket, which is a lot of money. And if it hadn't been for um, for the quality of the show and for what I've been told about the show and how good it is, then I probably wouldn't have wanted to have paid £90. In fact, if I didn't have to pay £90, I would rather have not paid £90. But, um, you know, I went and also saw Frozen this week. And Frozen is another really feel-good show, very different, obviously, from Cabaret, but you've got actors in that show working at the top of their game, very similarly to Cabaret. You know, they're all wonderful performers in that production. And uh, I paid £25 for that ticket. And you go, two very different prices for two very different shows. Which one was better? What did you enjoy more? I enjoyed them both thoroughly. Would I rather pay £25 or £90? <laughs> Probably 25 But then you're absolutely right. If you're, if you're up north and a ticket is £15 or £20 as standard for a really good ticket, that's the way it should be done in London. And how many more people would go to the theatre and enjoy theatre if that was the case? It gets priced out of so many people's budgets because of these uber expensive tickets, you know. £90 in Cabaret wasn't even the most expensive ticket, but I think quite a, quite a way. And you're going, who can afford to buy those tickets? Because I wouldn't want to, and I, I work hard. <laughs> You know, I, I, I do think that the uh, the pricing in London is is pretty extreme and uh, and you don't always get the best quality theatre work for the ticket price that you pay. 
I know I've just booked some tickets and it was £45, not a restricted view. Yeah, I know. Well, that's the thing, right? Exactly. Are you prepared to get a restricted view? And I think mine and Cabaret were restricted view too, because I couldn't see anything up here. I could only see uh, it was all capped at a certain point, which was a shame. I didn't miss much, I don't believe. But still, £90 for a restricted view, £45 for a restricted view. You sort of go, some money getting to see half the show? It's, you know, no, I'm sure it won't be that bad. But yes, tickets are expensive. And what do you think of shows what do the um, subtitles? Do you, do you dread them shows in case you forget the lines? Oh, I don't know. Sometimes. I remember, um, I remember the first time that happened, we had a captioned, a captioned pro- uh, performance, is what they call it. And uh, yeah, you're right, they have, they have the, uh, these big banners either side that, that bring, the, bring the lines down, as we're saying them. So someone's sitting there checking, you know, well, not checking what we're saying, but as we're saying it, they will bring the next line up. So someone that um, is maybe uh, sort of audio impaired or whatever, We'll be able to ca- keep up with the show, right? Yes. If you forget your line, you could be very sneaky and have a look and see what it says. But people tend to, people don't, I, I don't know. I'd like to think people were so enthralled in your performance <laughs> that they wouldn't even notice that you muddled up the line. Um, to be honest with you, though, everyone was so good and so consistent uh, in our show that I, that I would like to think that we didn't make too many mistakes that would have been picked up. But uh, I'm sure that I'm sure it did happen. And I'm sure some audience members who were reading along thought that doesn't seem right. But there we go. Obviously, you've done musicals. Would you like to do some like pinter work or something? Hmm. I think um, I think with a lot of those uh, those certainly people like Pinter, um, any of the Shakespeare work, mm. you have to earn the right to deal with that kind of work in a way and what I mean by that is so I did a musical theatre degree my 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 training is very musical theatre I would still consider myself a strong actor and I have worked hard at it but I haven't taken the steps necessarily at this stage of my career I feel to warrant casting me in a Shakespeare piece unless they really believe in me and they are prepared to to offer me that role. If I decided tomorrow, that's it, no more musical theatre, I hang my musical theatre, I hang my dance shoes up, I'm going to only do Shakespeare at the Globe now, then I might be out of work for a long time. I might have to take some time away to to really re, you know think about it and, and prepare myself to do a good job as per what they would want rather than a musical theatre audition. They're very different worlds in a way. So um, I would love to, absolutely love to. But I think at this early stage of my career, perhaps it's easiest and best to focus on musical theatre and take out of that everything that is possible to take out of that and learn as much as possible so that when it comes to these other opportunities, I'm in a really good position. So eventually, yes, but at this stage, I think the focus is still musical theatre, I'm afraid. Um, how did acting start in a very young you? <laughs> what oh, ignited yeah. the spark? So I, uh, I started quite late, you know. I actually only did my first ever show when I was in my last year at secondary school or last year of um, grammar school. So we did a production of Evita which actually coincidentally happened to be my first ever professional show, which was a Vita as well. Um, there was a chap called Ashley Fulton, who was a singing coach. And then he was the musical director of Avita at school. And then he would later become my mentor and taught me everything I kind of needed to know to get me ready for drama school and for the industry in London, as he had been there and he'd done it himself. So... My, I think my interest in theatre and acting and singing began when I was 17, turning 18, which isn't that long ago, because I'm only 24 now. So, you know, six, seven years ago, really, was when it all kind of began, um, maybe eight years ago at a push. And 
and then eventually um because of ashley's mentorship and his help and his guidance i got a place at a drama school in london and i came across and did my three years of training and i uh went out into the industry to fend for myself <laughs> and uh and that's that yeah so what do you think of drama skills like rather and things i think they're brilliant <clears throat> and i think you, think um, you I get think more chance of roles from rather or is it just look i think i think there's a there's a politically correct answer and there's a non-politically <laughs> correct answer and I think I'll go with the politically correct answer because I think I believe in it to a degree. And I, I think I believe in it because um, I think I might be a a good example of it, or I'd like to think I was a good example of it. But the answer is that it doesn't matter what drama school you go to. If you go to the right one that for you, as in the one that, that you really feel at home at and that you you kind of believe in and you feel believe in you, then you will naturally do a better job and be in a better position at the end of your training than if you go to a drama school that you don't really fit into, that you feel isn't really up your street, that you don't really enjoy being at. You know, it's like anything. If you love something, you will always want to put more effort into it. You'll always want to get more out of it. But there's also an element of truth in if you work hard and you are a team player, then you will always do better. You know, you will always be okay. You get out as much as you put in, is that sort of sense of, if you work really hard at something, it'll always come come good at the end. So that's the um, that's the politically correct answer, because, and I, and I, I, think, I think I do believe that. I think you have to believe that if you're prepared to work hard, then you should be prepared to, well, you should have some success at the end. But um, it's a difficult industry, so, in some respects, it doesn't matter what drama school you go to. There will be always be some people who appear to be very fortunate and do very well. And there will always be some people who are less fortunate and don't seem to do so well. And it's hard to say why those things are ever the case. Sometimes people get lucky. Sometimes you can make yourself more lucky. Sometimes it just doesn't seem fair. It's a, it's a very difficult question um, in that there's no real one answer to it. And what happened when you left drama school? Did you get any work straight away or was it a long time? So I was very, I was very fortunate. I, we finished drama school in May of 2019. Um, and I think in April, I think it was the 7th of April, because it was just before my birthday, I had booked uh Evita, my first ever professional job. Um so there had been a little break. I think we'd had a week off from college after our showcase, which was the last kind of public performance we did with university with, with drama school. And um in that time off, my girlfriend and I had booked holidays to um to go to Budapest um in Hungary, I believe. And uh, I hope it's in Hungary, otherwise I'm going to sound very silly. Um, anyway, we booked our holiday. The following week, or the, on the Friday rather, I think I had met with my NAI agent and I had said that I would like to sign with him. And by the end of that day, I had two auditions through. And one of them was for a production of Titanic, which I didn't get past the first round for. And the other one was for Evita. But unfortunately, Evita was set to be on Thursday afternoon, the day that I was due to fly to Budapest. So we moved our flights. Well, I moved my flight. My girlfriend went out on her own, moved my flight, and I went to the audition. And they said, that's brilliant. Could you come back tomorrow on Friday? <clears throat> and I thought, ah, I booked another flight for Friday. So I or booked another flight for Thursday, Thursday night rather than Wednesday night or something along those lines. Anyway, I had to go back on Friday. I had to book another flight, went to the audition, and thought, that's great. I can go on Friday night. I'll still get a nice weekend in Budapest. And sure enough, they said, no, can you come back on Saturday? So then I had to book another flight. I think mm -hmm. I had less than two days in Budapest. But I was very lucky I got that job. So I actually booked that job a month before my degree finished. It didn't start until, I think, June or late May. So I had some time off after drama school, about a month where I just 
did a bit of work here, there, and everywhere, and enjoyed being a free man outside of the educational institutions for the first time in his life. And uh, and then I started that job in um, in sort of June uh, at Regent's Park Open Air Theatre. So I was very lucky. It was very quick for me. Of the do theatre work, would you like to do TV work or films? Yes, I would. I've been I've been very close at points to hopefully getting some TV work. But um, unfortunately, until you have it, it's not yours. So uh, so I'd, I'd very much like to do some TV and film work. I, um, I, remember, I remember in Northern Ireland, a long time before wanting to really be an actor, maybe it was one of the sparks that set it off, but uh, a long time, certainly before I came to London, I did a bit of extras work, which is, you know, you turn up to a production and you... You get told where to stand and you might pretend to chat with someone or whatever. But anyways, it was really good fun. It was for a film called The Lost City of Z or The Lost City of Z or something like that. It had uh, Charlie Hunnan and Robert Pattinson, who are some kind of household names who were who were featuring in this film. And it was um, <clears throat> a World War I sequence, trench warfare, and they built trenches into the hillside in Northern Ireland. And we were sort of collected up in a bus and taken out to this war scene and given army uniforms and a rifle and some fake grenades and such things and told to roll around in the mud. And we uh, basically played soldiers for two or three days. And it was the most fun. It was so much fun. It wasn't high-end acting. In fact, it probably wasn't really acting at all for, <laughs> for a lot of us. We were just there having a laugh. And pretending to be soldiers, and there were explosions going off, and people firing fake machine guns up on the hill. It was so much fun, and uh, to be able to get back in front of a camera and do something like that is actually, I think, probably one of my all-time dreams, bucket list jobs, is to be a soldier in a movie who's fighting people. It's just, it's just the best fun. It's just the best fun. Um, you just said it had Robert Pattinson in. That's a new background. <laughs> He is the new Batman. Yes, I was stood closer to to Robert Pattinson, who is the new Batman, than than and probably you could even than COVID would even allow. This was pre-COVID, a long time pre-COVID. We were stood back to back at one point. I don't think he'll have a clue who I am, but uh, it certainly was easier for me to remember who he was. Yeah, I was in Liverpool be oh, two years ago, and now we're filming Batman, so yes. I saw a bit of it. So. Oh yeah. I haven't seen the movie myself. It's definitely on my list. I need to go and have a watch. It's a shame Holby City's finished and think you'd be good in that. Holby City. Oh, that's very kind. I, I'd quite like to do something like that. It would be it'd be good fun. Or uh, or the um Hollyoaks or any of those kind of TV series. They're they're always good a good laugh. And I have a it's funny how in the industry you have a lot of friends who suddenly end up being plucked out and thrown into something like Hollyoaks or Holby City or any of these doctors, you see a lot of people that you recognise on the television and it's it's quite weird. People that you went to drama school with and they're on the telly. Um, if you did go in Hollyoaks or something, how long would you stay for? I know people I say a year and a half, but Ken Barlow's been in Coronation Street 50, 50 odd years. I know. Well, look, this is the thing. If you find something you love, why would you ever give it up or why would you ever change it? It's a it's a toss up because part of the part of the joy of being an actor is also one of the downsides of being an actor, which is you never really tend to do work for too long, the same thing for too long. All I knew personally when I left school, when I was leaving school, was that what I wanted to do in life couldn't be the same thing every day. Couldn't be sat behind the same desk with the same people talking about the same stuff every day. <laughs> And what I inadvertently managed to do was ensure that I'd never do a job for too long, the same thing for too long, by picking this life and this career. So if I was to be offered something like Hollyoaks, you're absolutely right. Usually people probably stay for, say, a year and a half, and maybe they then go on to do something different. And that's a bit of the joy of being an actor is that you can do that. You don't have to stay in the same place for too long. But then if you find something you love and you love doing, why would you ever leave that thing? So if uh, if you if you find that you were offered Hollyoaks and they and they gave you a nice part and the part was really interesting, 
and it was constantly changing and developing and a new storyline and all the rest, why would you ever leave? If they didn't want you to, that'd be great. Just stay on and have a lovely time. But uh, but it's a it's a crazy old world out there, and and it works works for you and against you. So it's impossible to say how things will go. Um, so but, so uh, you got that um, a role in Emmerdale for three yes. years. Would you move yes. up to Yorkshire or commute from London? <laughs> I think I would absolutely move up to Yorkshire. My um my second job was in Leeds. I lived in Leeds for about four, four and a half months or thereabouts. And it was one of the happiest times that I've ever spent in my career. Leeds is an absolutely wonderful city. And I stayed with three wonderful women, um, a couple and then their friend whilst I was up there. And they had the most extraordinary house and they were the most lovely people. Um, and I just couldn't get over how how kind they were and how lovely they were and how how brilliant Leeds was as a city. So I would have no issues living up there. I love it up that up that end. So uh absolutely. Um if an actor dropped dropped out at in the last minute and you had yes. two hours notice to step in, would you do that? <laughs> 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 it depends it depends on a lot of things for example in some roles in our work there is an obligation to do exactly that if someone drops out and you are their cover responsibility or you cover their part absolutely you would be well prepared and you would just go for it because you'd know what you were doing you'd have been taught all of the cover rule so you'd know their track you'd know their songs you know their scenes you know everything so all you'd have to do is get yourself in the right headspace and the right mindset, and then you go for it. If, however, you had been not playing that part and you had no idea what they did on stage, then it's obviously a little bit scarier. <laughs> I, I think I would probably do the old trick of, I'm just going to go get my makeup bag out of the car, and then I would be never seen of again. <laughs> no, I'm sure I would absolutely go for it. I would love to think I would. I would give it a good go, but um, I have no idea how it would turn out. And um, what would be your dream role if you had? Oh, that's. I'm afraid that's an impossible question to answer. I think, um, for fear of sounding a bit corny, I think the fact that the fact that I'm able to perform at all is a bit of a dream in itself. In that, I certainly didn't expect. I think, and I don't think, I'll, I think a lot of people that I grew up around didn't expect for me to end up being here doing what I'm doing. So in, in that respect, to be to be having any level of success, if we want to call it that, in the industry is a bit of a dream. However, that being said, we talked about the Batman earlier. They haven't got a Batman musical as, as far as I know, but I'm sure I would like to play the Batman. <laughs> and what's the best advice you could give somebody who's wanting acting as a career? Can I give it can I give a bit of jokey advice and then a bit of more serious <laughs> advice? Yeah. My jokey advice would be laminate your notes so when you're crying, you don't smudge the ink. But uh obviously that's a, that is a joke. Um <laughs> You shouldn't have to be crying to be an actor or an actress. You should be. They should be supporting you, and you should be well guided. Um, my best advice would be, what would it actually be? Um, you can't take anything too seriously. the The name of the game is to play. It's a play, you know. Like, or let's let's call it like a. You know, when you go and see a play. In a you know a show or even even TV or film or or anything, it all looks very serious and 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 in many respects it is. But the only way to be able to do crazy things like Robert Pattinson in the Batman is to be playful. I know it seems silly because when we think about playful, it seems like you know almost like children playing with toys and it's all happy and there's laughter. But you still have to be playful to pretend to be angry and to pretend to be upset. And you've got to be able to let yourself go and just do those things rather than going 
feeling too conscious or too conscious rather and, and not wanting to maybe make yourself look silly. If you can be silly, it's going to be so much easier. Allow yourself to let go and be silly. That's that's probably the best. The best. Uh, oh, and also drink lots of water. There's no substitute for drinking lots of water, I'm afraid. Just do it. And that, Well, being silly, I have seen the play that goes wrong. That's quite funny. Yes, and that's, exactly. Well, that must be hard work being, obviously, you've got to make it look silly, and but it's an unsafe, but it has to be safe with set flying. Yeah. You know? I think that's hard work to make it look like everything's going wrong, but it's planned. Exactly. Well, that's the that's the absolute the absolute. Uh, you're absolutely right in that. So much is going wrong, but they know exactly what's happening. That's the serious side versus the playful side. The playful side is the the way they respond to everything and the way that that it's so funny, and we then respond to them being silly on stage. But the serious side is they know exactly what's going to happen. It's all safe. No one's going to get hurt, hopefully, and. Uh, and there's they're in control of the whole show so that's that's the thing as long as you know how to be in control then it gives you the space to be silly sometimes rather than being silly all the time and hoping that you don't lose control which is a very different approach in which case people do sometimes get hurt and things go wrong and sometimes it's funny when things go wrong and it can add to the comedy or it can add to the humor but sometimes when things go wrong it can be you know, people, it can go really wrong. And that's when you want to want to make sure that you're in control and uh, and that everything's being done properly. Ever do pantomimes? I love a good pantomime. You know, before I booked 9 to 5, uh, can I say this? I'm sure I can. Before I booked 9 to 5, I actually was offered a pantomime. It was a very good friend of mine that came to me and uh, and asked if I wanted to audition for his pantomime or pantomimes that he was pr- helping to produce. And at that time, I didn't have a job, so I said absolutely, and I that I, I was very grateful to, and I still am very grateful to to him for for the opportunity. Um, and I would have been playing Prince Charming, although I don't know, I don't find myself that charming. Um, Prince Charming, and it would have been it would have been really good fun and. Uh, it was it was a real shame that unfortunately nine to five's schedule came through and we hadn't agreed on the pantomime. I've been offered it, but I hadn't signed the contract or anything. And uh, yeah, nine to five schedule came through and it just didn't quite tie up, which was a real shame because it would have been absolutely amazing to have been able to have been in both things. But there was an ever so slight overlap, and uh, and it meant that I had to pick one or the other. And um, sadly, nine to five took the yeah it went that way in, in the end but um i would absolutely love to do pantomime i think it would be so much fun all of the people i've ever worked with that have done pantomime tell tell me about the the laughs and the and how how ridiculous it is and and how it's just really good really good fun although very hard work i believe they do up to 10 shows a week normally possibly even more if they're if they're unfortunate so it can be really difficult work for them so I think they it have does, to have a laugh. It does sound hard work when you're trying to... Obviously, it's full of young people, and so it's quite hard to get yes. them entertained. <laughs> You've got to use yes. twice as much energy. Of course. I uh, I absolutely agree. I think, um, obviously, our, our audiences in 9 to 5 are all a bit more adult uh, because it's just tailored for that. But, but yes, if you're in a pantomime and you're playing to houses of young families... You know that's hard work. You need to make sure that's when you really need to be prepared to be silly. And if you can be silly, then you'll you'll win them over absolutely. I know when I've seen someone play buttons before, he was really energetic. They must have been shattered when he come up. Yes, I think you would. Uh, I think you'd be sweating a lot every night. And then he'd, he'd come round the stage, running round the auditorium, squirting yes. everybody. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. He must have yeah, had a can be... of Red Bull before he started. <laughs> You'd be fit as a fiddle by the end of that job, I'm sure. Um, would you ever go on cruise ships as well? Yeah, I think so. I have a lot of friends who have been on cruise ships or are currently on cruise ships, and uh, I think the uh, I think the experience again can be quite isolating because you are, you know, you're with your cast and and you're with all the people on the cruise ships, but they're not necessarily your people. They're not necessarily your girlfriend or boyfriend or or family or whatever. The people that you want to go and spend your time with 
you know, I, I spend a lot of time with my mum. I, I love my mum a lot, and I, I like spending time with her. And uh, it's important for me to be able to see her. Uh, I love spending time with my girlfriend. Um, you know, and if you're on a cruise ship, they're going around America, chances are they can't just pop in for tea or you can't pop back for tea, you know? So it's, in those respects, it's a little difficult. But cruise ship shows are almost exactly the same in many respects as the shows that would go into the West End. So in some respects, they're really good shows to be in. And uh, I would say for that, for that alone, there's no, there's no reason not to do cruise ships. But you also have to ask yourself if, if you're, you know, if you are in a relationship or say you had a young family, wouldn't it be a little unfortunate if, uh, if you were off on a cruise ship and your partner had to look after your little girl or little boy or whatever, or even your dog, or, you know, it's a bit unfair then to just lump them every, every responsibility whilst you go off and, have a nice time on a show on a cruise ship going around the Caribbean. Yeah, I think I think sometimes there are other things to consider too, of course. But um I would do a cruise ship. I I'd love the idea of of being in a show on a cruise ship. But maybe not for an entire year. Maybe for six months or something. A shorter one. And um, sometimes there's these um reality shows when Andrew Lloyd Webb was looking for um to play Nancy. Yeah. Did you do one of them shows? Or would you Oh, I, I, th- I guess I, I maybe would. Yes, I am. Um, I'll tell you a story. We we mentioned earlier about uh, auditioning for uh, over Zoom, like we're on Zoom at the moment, and uh, and and you sort of had a giggle because you said, you know, have you ever done any auditions on Zoom? And I sort of thought I had done one actually, and I didn't do very well. And um, the reason for that was it was for the voice. Uh, you know, the voice. That they have the three chairs and the buzzers and they turn around and and uh the voice is kind of mainly for pop music or music that that kind of music rather than musical theater music but i don't really enjoy singing a lot of pop music it's not really my thing you know i'm musical theater trained i enjoy singing musical theater style show, uh, songs I'm, I'm learning to enjoy pop more now but i didn't really enjoy it at the time so when they came to ask what I wanted to sing, I chose Stars from Les Miserables, which is very not pop, it's very musical theatre. And uh, and then a song called Evermore from Beauty and the Beast, which is a song I audition with for shows all the time. But again, not very pop, very musical theatre. And, uh, and I didn't do so well in my audition for The Voice because I didn't sing any pop. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, I would. I would quite like to be on something like, maybe a maybe closer to finding Maria or something like that. I mean, I'm never going to play Maria. Of course, I'm not going to play Maria. It'd be the most peculiar casting bracket. But uh, but yeah, something like that. I probably would because it's more musical theatre, but still a still a search for and still hopefully would would mean that people would see you and you'd be on this platform and uh, and it would be really useful in that respect. But I quite enjoy being on the stage as well, so I don't. I don't feel I need to to go up for talent shows. So, say you went on one of them shows, how would you handle coming second or third? I think. Uh, I mean, it must be tough when you get told you need it there, but not quite good enough. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, it, it's the same. I guess it'd be exactly the same as when you're you go to finals for an audition for a show. And then they decide not to offer you the job. And it means they've offered someone else the job generally, which in sort of most basic terms, I think immediately to yourself would feel like you failed and that someone else was better than you. And uh, in some things in life, that's fair enough. Like if you're running a running race, and someone runs faster than you, then they're going to win the medal. But in musical theatre, it doesn't, or even in acting in general, it doesn't necessarily. It isn't necessarily always that way. If you've gotten to audition and get a recall, and then go to a final audition, and it could be four or five, six rounds in for a show, then they've already already decided that you're capable of doing the show, that they like something about what you're doing, and they're just making sure that you fit into their jigsaw of the entire show, right? 
So if you don't get the job after you've been to finals for a show, it doesn't necessarily mean that you weren't good enough or that you weren't better than somebody else. It just means that someone was a better fit for their production than you might have been. Or you just might not have done as good a job on that day. That's also a fair point. But um, but it doesn't always necessarily mean that you weren't good enough. So it's a lesson to learn, and it takes time to learn it, that is just because you didn't get the job or you were like maybe second or third choice, a bit like coming second or third in a talent contest or a running race, then yes, I think you need to learn that it isn't necessarily, it isn't necessarily a failure in that you haven't failed. You've done really well to get to where you were, you know? Um, but yes, obviously there is still, a, it's still difficult to, to not, to put all that work in, to, to really believe in, in, in the show and really, really want it, then to be told it's not going to go your way, that is difficult. It's a, there's no getting around the fact that it's difficult. We all, I think we all deal with that differently. Um, I deal with it by, I think, going, oh, well, it is what it is. Hmm. And I'm now going to go to the pub. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's always going to be something else. There's always going to be something more. And there's always going to be another audition. So, generally speaking it's easiest just to to move on and believe in the future rather than worry about the past um see you were under a lot of weather for the afternoon <laughs> at the west end of your hand what would what musical would you create if there's any left that is <laughs> i think uh, i think he might be scraping the barrel for musical ideas he's done very well as andrew lloyd webber um if i was andrew lloyd webber I would write musicals for Northern Irish people. I mean, he has, because he has got the beautiful game. Maybe I would stick the beautiful game on again, or the boys in the photograph, whichever it's called now. Um, but uh, I would stick that musical on in a West End venue and I'd hire some genuine Northern Irish people. I couldn't tell you the last time I sang in my own accent. And my accent's not very strong, but there isn't a huge amount of Northern Irish musical theatre. Um, there are, there are plenty of Irish musical theatre at shows. Uh, thinking of um, like uh, the commitments and um, oh, I mean here we go. I've made my point. I can't think of it very much. <laughs> I would I would put a, a, a lovely Northern Irish musical like the Beautiful Game, Andrew Lloyd Webber, wink wink, nudge nudge, on in a West End theatre and and. There's a, there are loads of Northern Irish performers, high caliber Northern Irish performers out there who would absolutely love to do a show about Northern Ireland, honoring Northern Ireland and the history of Northern Ireland. And uh, I would absolutely love to do it. I'd love to see it. So if I was Andrew Lloyd Webber, I would do that. I've got one last question, I think. For sure. Um, what is your next role or venture you've got planned? Well, I do have the a holiday. Well, I do. I'm I'm very lucky. I do have an next venture, although I don't know if it's officially been uh been released yet. So I can't. I don't know if I can really say. I'm afraid. But what I can say is I'm gonna I'm gonna be seeing lots of European cities for a while. But uh, I'm afraid I can't say too much more, I'm afraid. But uh, I'm very excited about it. We start fairly shortly and uh, it'll be good fun, but I'm, I don't think I'm allowed to say anything more <laughs> for fear of fear of then being uninvited to the party. <laughs> well, that's about it. <laughs> I know I said um, 15 or 20 minutes, but that was an hour ago. No, that's quite all right. I think we've, we've had a lovely chat. It's been very nice to, to discuss everything with you and... Uh, yeah, no, thank you very much for asking me to to do this. I hope it uh I hope it's been useful. Hopefully it didn't come across as nervous. <laughs> no, not at all, not at all. Don't don't uh, don't berate yourself. This is the thing. It's an interesting thing in the acting world as well, how we always feel nervous with auditions and with shows. As I said to you at the start when you asked about how to deal with it, sometimes, you know, it's just about having that little word with yourself and going, ah, you know. It's all right to feel nervous, but actually, you're going to be fine. Everything's going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. There's another thing where there's a very fine line in feeling nervous about something and feeling excited about something. If the next time you're really excited about something, you take a moment to think about how it feels, and then the next time you're really nervous about something, you take a moment to feel to sort of recognize how it feels. 
they're very similar. And uh, it's useful to be able to go, I know I feel nervous, but I'm just going to tell myself I'm excited about it. Because one, what nerves make you not want to do anything and excitement makes you want to do more. So uh, it's just funny how we can take kind of ownership of those things and and uh, and not let it prevent us from doing anything. But you you weren't nervous at all. So Thank don't you. you worry. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. <laughs> I will do. You too.